Hello, and welcome back to Having Fun Repairs. Got a neat little, uh, a lot of broken Tamagotchi toys. If y'all recall, these were very popular when I was in, uh, uh, I want to say I was in middle school. Um, but anyways, I, uh, I got these off of eBay in a broken repair lot uh, for $29.99 and then uh, $8.25 shipping. And the description was uh, purchased from an estate sale and found that around half didn't respond to new batteries. The yellow one is not a digital game. Maybe someone out there knows how to get them up and running. Uh, Tamagotchi and virtual pet, etc. A lot of nine broken for parts only, condition shoes. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, when I got this in, it's actually more than just the yellow one. The yellow one is uh, mechanical wise. I think that centerpiece is supposed to spin, I would believe, when you open it, so uh, we'll probably take this apart to we'll definitely get this one cleaned up, see how it works. This one right here is not uh, electrical either, it's just a, uh, you know, little printed uh, picture on the front of a Tamagotchi, so this is just more or less a, uh, a keychain. It does have some interesting things on it, plastics, we'll definitely take this apart and uh, clean it up as well. I wonder if at one point in time it made some type of sound. Uh, but then we have remaining one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven uh, Tamagotchis. Uh, if that is exactly what they are. This one's called Giga Pets. So I imagine it's a little bit different. That's a Giga Pet Digipooch. Tiger Electronics. Tiger Electronics. This one's made by Tiger. Uh, Giga Pets, uh, Lost World, I imagine it's going to be some kind of dinosaur. Uh, we have a Tata Puppy. Uh, let's see, made in 1997 MGA Entertainment. Um, okay. We'll probably just title this video uh, Digital Pets instead of Tamagotchi. Because I'm not sure all these were made by Tamagotchi. I have my doubts that they were. This one was made in China. It's called a PC Puppy. Now notice that the LCD has some uh, some bleed going on in there. Well, there is a method to not necessarily fix this but minimize that bleed that uh, we'll try to do. And if I break it, well, I break it. That's the, the fun of working through and repairing things. Let's see, did I go over this one? That one was another Gigapet. And then this one as well as a Gigapet, or I don't know what this is. This might actually be an actual Tamagotchi. I don't see any markings on it. It just says made in China. It's got a little bird on it. And again, a bit of uh, LCD bleed in here. So the first things we need to do is actually figure out, uh, and this is probably going to be a short series of videos, which ones are actually working and which ones are not and jot it down on a piece of paper uh, to see where about, uh, what, what's the easiest way to tackle uh, these things. Uh, more than likely is I'll get these repaired up. Uh, I'll let my kids have first dibs who would like uh, which one. But uh, we have several kids that uh, attend the same church that uh, we do. So I'm probably going to uh, see if their parents would like a, a little digital pet for their kids and they can choose which one they uh, they want. So um, let's go ahead and uh, work on testing these to see uh, which ones work and which ones do not. Thank you. 
Okie dokie. Let me turn on the mic real quick. So initial troubleshooting done, and I put these last because uh, looking through the bag, they're just McDonald's toys. This one needs to be cleaned up. I've got the uh, manufactured for McDonald's uh, from Bandai imprinted on them. Uh, these two right here. However, this one, as I suspect, the centerpiece is supposed to spin and it doesn't do it perfectly. So we'll take both of those apart anyways. Uh, nine Tamagotchis ranging in issues. Let's see the Tata puppy it powered on. The buttons work. You have sound. I added that in later. Uh, just needs a thorough clean. So probably save that one for one of the last uh, repairs uh, because there's essentially nothing else to it. However, we have a lot that just did not power on and I put a little annotation beside clean that there's corrosion because I noticed a lot of corrosion on the battery contacts. Potentially that's the only issue, um, so probably not a whole lot to do with them. However, uh, this one did power on but it's got that uh, LCD bleed. I'll probably take this apart in one of the first during this first video see if we can't get rid of that bleed because I uh, presume if you're watching this that's something that you definitely would want to see if it can be uh, mended um what else yeah so a lot of these wouldn't power on I couldn't determine if there was sound because it wouldn't power on I couldn't determine the buttons function because it wouldn't power on uh, so hopefully this ends up being an interesting video not sure not sure how many videos I'll turn this into because like I said I'll probably turn this into a series I don't want to make this a an hour or two hour long video nobody as um, you see in some of those popular memes ain't nobody got time for that uh, so more than likely what I'm going to do in this first video is just um, maybe tackle just these three for now not sure that's the best approach to it um, two mechanical no, one just a keychain, mechanical and electrical, plus an LCD bleed issue. Uh, we'll take them apart and uh, start cleaning them. I'll do this one first. So this was more than just a little keychain. Appears like there was an LED in here. Uh, some very old batteries. I'm going to have to order some of these uh, L736 uh, I believe these are 1.5 volt batteries. Uh, unfortunately the plastics are so old uh, some things broke as I was taking it apart. Not too pleased about that. Uh, and just me prying out that battery. Didn't serve it too well. Well, we're going to at least check this LED to see if there's anything we can do with this. How is this actually actuated? How is it turned on? We have a spring. in on the screen, I mean, on the uh, screen itself. This set in here like that, and as you press in on the spring, you close the circuit uh, between those batteries and the LEDs to illuminate it. So it's like a little miniature flashlight. Um, let me take my power supply. And hook it up. Just see if that LED still works. Ooh, a little nice flashlight keychain. 
This LED should be burned out. Mine could be burnt out. I'm not entirely positive. But it's not. So we still have a working LED. That's cool. Uh, perhaps we get all these parts cleaned up and uh, order some batteries and have a little working thing again. Uh, let's do some more teardown. Okay, so a little bit of light sanding and cleaning with alcohol we've done. We've got a pretty nice shine. Uh, if you saw, uh, shavings came off. It's one of the big ones. Eh, it's small, comparative, I guess, depending on how you want to view things. Uh, just by sanding. Uh, so we've lost a lot of uh, rigid, uh, well, rigidity. Is that the word I'm looking for? Yeah, probably bit of strength in these leads here coming off of this diode. So what I'm going to do to try to give it a little bit of mass back is I'm going to put a, a bead of flux down these and allow solder to run up the uh, leads to give them a little bit of strength. Uh, and then we can mold them, remold them again and stick them back into the, uh, the casing after we get that cleaned. So that's what I'm going to do next. So off camera, I went in and put uh, the clamshell case for this toy in the sink and cleaned it up with some water, uh, warm water and, and soap. So I got that set aside for drying. Um, and we'll come back to it in a minute. Um, it was rather interesting to find that there was uh, some type of uh, electronic in there. Um, so. And of course, you saw me add some solder to the uh, legs for this LED to give it a little bit of mass back and cleaned it up. Uh, we'll work. We'll go back to that one uh, and finish seeing if we can try to get that to uh, put back together. And oh, thank you, thank you for that, buddy. I guess I threw away the spring by accident. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go back to that one in a minute, but um, let's move on to this guy. Again, another McDonald's toy. This one's a mechanical. Daddy, that one's mine. It sure is. Yeah, the has a little. Daddy, the blue top is matching. Okay. So that must be a nice shiny one. That's quite a blue. Yeah. They always have the blue. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, this one was a really big struggle to get into. And, and it's because they actually put a bead of glue down on these pegs. Uh, fortunately, I broke that peg trying to get into here. And you can see, I don't know if you can tell, but you can see the epoxy that's used to help hold those portions in place. Uh, interesting small little mechanical design. So this is the back half of the bottom part of the clamshell. And I'll clean this one up as well. The kids are playing and getting loud. But essentially what occurs is you have this uh, little notch right here, this little post. And as this slides up, depending on how well you can get this move, it pushes that top and it should rotate it. And then this one should come down and it'll rotate to the next character. Next character. Yeah. Daddy, so I can do that. So Daddy, can I do that? Oh yeah. Yeah, well, we'll have to get this one cleaned up, buddy. But uh, I think maybe just with a tad bit of grease, I think this one will be good enough to call good. Hey Daddy, can I turn the characters? Daddy, can I really turn the characters? Yeah. Let me get the, let me get this cleaned up off camera, and uh, we'll get it greased up next, and uh, put it back together. Okay, so I got all these parts cleaned up in some warm soapy water off camera, and I think what I'm going to do next is. Uh, Probably just shave this down with my Dremel, Dremel so that way there's no obstruction putting this back in. Um, maybe apply a little bit of uh, lubrication, uh, maybe some grease or something to this, and put it back together and see how it goes from there. All right, uh, our first little Tamagotchi toy, successful repair, <laughs> it's swapping now, it gets stuck a little bit, but not too bad, <laughs> I guess we can move over to other repairs now, all right, focusing our attention back to this one, because uh, it's dried up, I'm going to try to super glue these back in place don't know if it's going to last very well um, additionally the uh, vinegar I cleaned this off with alcohol afterwards took off the uh, nickel plated coating on this nickel. copper uh, little contact sleeve so I'm gonna to try to use more than likely I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean this up and use some lead free solder uh, to give it some type of plating um, so hopefully it doesn't corrode again in the future. Obviously the corrosion due to the batteries. Um, so I think for now we'll get this mechanically sound. Uh, hopefully. And depending when my batteries are delivered, I did go on Amazon and order some L736 1.5 volt uh, watch batteries. Yeah, baby girl. My daughter is watching me at this point. Uh, we'll get this mechanically put together, electrically sound, hopefully, and uh, wait for the batteries to come in to get this guy working too. So now it's going to be doing some repairs. I'll be fast forwarding through most of this. Uh, you can watch if you want to or skip past the fast forwarding a bit, but uh, yeah, that's where we're at.
So the only way we can even remotely or potentially have success of providing a sacrificial layer of metal uh, plating, you know, it's not not technically plating this uh, with uh, with solder, uh, lead free. That is, is to make sure that this is as clean as possible. So that's why I use the Dremel and the wire brush to really clean up this copper get it nice and shiny I'm gonna clean it off with some alcohol next and then we'll try to get a uh, sacrificial layer of metal on top of this uh, copper contact or sacrificial layer of metal is that what I said I can't remember anyways okay for me that process was pretty much an utter disaster uh, Lead-free solder has a sometimes a much higher melting temperature. Uh, its eutectic state isn't good as leaded solder, especially uh, SN95. Um, Try to add in flux, uh, rosin core flux, and then I went to a thinner diameter lead-free uh, alloy to solder, and I could get some to uh, stay on this uh, copper. Uh, it took a lot of heat, but um, not nearly as well as I was hoping it was going to do. I was hoping with heat underneath and the solder applied to the top, once this was up to temp, it would just melt and coat towards the heat but it obviously wasn't acting that way and then the uh, flux was getting so goopy uh, adhesion wasn't that great either so I'm just going to leave this as is and call it what it is I don't have uh, a means to uh, nickel plate this uh, copper sleeve at all so we'll just call it what it is I'll work on getting the uh, parts back in there pending battery Alright, so I got this one back together for now. Just gonna let it uh, sit pending batteries uh, coming in. And once the batteries are in, we'll test it out, see if it uh, Oops. actually uh, lights up the LED. Okay. So I suppose now it's time to move on to the one that you've probably been wanting to see, especially as I mentioned, I might have a way of uh, getting rid of this uh, LCD bleed or at least minimize the impact of it being on the screen. So we'll move to that one next.
All right, took it all apart. You'll notice that uh, between the last little segment, this one, I uh, soldered in two wires so that way I can inject from my power supply a three volt source for testing. Also took off the uh, piezoelectric speaker uh, from these points here. And let me zoom in real quick. Just like with some other items, I wanted to figure out what was going on. I went through, again, a couple of revisions and eventually... So I eventually came to this uh, basic block diagram and developing this, trying to reverse engineer it a bit, took me a while, um, actually several hours. Um, hopefully I got some of these things right, but I'll allow somebody else to, uh, to uh, point out what might be wrong, or if there's anything wrong currently on my diagram. Uh, maybe you can add to it. Again, I'll upload this diagram to my uh, Google site. But anyways, so you have your uh, your battery voltage uh, coming in, 3 volts DC. Uh, it should be minus, it should be plus, so positive and negative side of your battery. Uh, there goes the positive side, there goes the, the negative side. Uh, you hit between these a uh, decoupling capacitor, a 47 uh, microfarad capacitor uh, to segregate your circuit followed by uh, another small cap I believe, I think it was uh, this one right here I was looking at yes yeah, that one uh, I didn't take a capacitive measurement of it because I didn't want to remove this off the board etc but uh, from there, you hit uh, a 1 in 4148 diode uh, going to switch, we'll call this switch S5, which was populated here on back of the PCB. The uh, this switch S5 is what I'm calling it. That was the uh, reset switch. Uh, I... I'm under the assumption that this is um, uh, protection for this, uh, what you might call a blob chip. Um, essentially, it's a, a chip on board. There's ICs on here physically attached to the board, fleet floating uh, runs going to a lot of different things, uh, traces and wires, runs, whatever, going to a lot of different things. Um, I didn't trace out all the traces on this uh, PCB coming from the cob. Uh, but I traced out what I feel is uh, mostly important. Alright, so if I didn't mention it, I believe this diode is used for reverse battery uh, protection. Uh, so if you put your, populate your batteries backwards and hit that reset switch or anything of that nature, it's just going to short your battery voltage back to the ground instead of into the, the ICs here, uh, possibly ruin ruining the uh, ruin, ruining this device all right so on the front we'll call these switches s1 through s4 those were the four buttons at the bottom that allow you left right arrow uh, I don't have the board the um, plastics in front of me they're sitting elsewhere because I just washed them in the sink to clean them up um, so these switches, uh, one leg of the of the switch is tied to ground. The other leg is going into the um, your IC here uh, to perform whatever function inside of it, it's looking for. So essentially, there I would presume there's uh, three volts coming down this line. I think I actually tested it with my multimeter, and then when the button's depressed, it sh shorts that voltage to ground, shunts it to ground. Uh, producing a low on that line and then the IC interprets it as a button press all right so you got those four buttons there then what do we have well we have the piezoelectric speaker that I took off uh, one line of it is tied to a capacitor presumably I believe for filtering uh, because you're you know you have a finite frequency range that this uh, this type of speaker can reproduce. Um, another reason why I took it off is I noticed that uh, one of these legs uh, wires that were soldered 
onto the board back here was essentially almost falling off anyway, so I'll re-solder that back on. All right. So what is this device up here? Well, luckily, this took me a while. Uh, I bent it up and I looked it up because I was just looking up here like, what is this thing? Is this a a relay? Is this a, a diode in here? Uh, what is this? And actually, it's a uh, it's a crystal. It's actually a um, what is the word for it? A um, a dip or DIP ceramic resonator. Uh, essentially, this is going to resonate a frequency of 480 kilohertz. And I'll show you that here in a second with some test equipment. Presumably, this is the clock for this uh, for whatever IC is in here. You have your uh, crystal resonating at 480 kilohertz uh, to keep uh, some type of clock source, which is needed for here. Uh, and then that is tied to uh, these resistors. Afterwards, you got two 20 mega ohm resistors. Um, so total 40 mega ohms that's one side going back to the to the cob here and then there's a uh, another line going to um, going to your cob uh, which is center tapped off of one of the resistors so that one's just 20 mega ohms going into here what it's all being used for i don't know because i don't know what's internal to this um, your guess is as best as mine i presumably uh, um, some kind of controlling IC, um, maybe some type form of um, uh, audio frequency amplifier as well, or driver for the speaker. Maybe one is not needed because it's not going to be incredibly loud, anyways. Um, maybe some uh, memory storing the actual program. Yeah, step away for a brief second. In, uh, interrupted kids need were needing something so where did I leave off uh, talked about this uh, 480 killers uh, crystal uh, potential clock source button presses lows being interpreted for something uh, speaker filtering reverse battery protection decoupling capacitor uh, I was on a bit about the ice, whatever IC or ICs are in here. I think I mentioned memory. All right. Yeah. So I think uh, I believe the actual program is stored stored in uh, memory in here. Not sure exactly what, um, but there would have to be something. Um, and also, the IC in here is going to drive your uh, LCD. That's what's out here to the right. I did count the top portion, uh, 24 individual, uh, uh, traces going to these, um, uh, termination points or pins or I'm losing what exactly they're called, but these points here and then two, uh, going to here, um, one that's fed to this side and that side, the other one comes down uh, this V over here and comes it up here. But um, a lot of these things, you, if you were to pin them out, you'd see that they go through the board, around the board, and they hit different pins. Same thing, uh, same thing over here as well. So that's essentially it. Uh, what was I going to do? Yeah, I was going to demonstrate... Uh, checking this frequency. I got two ways of doing it. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do, since I soldered these wires onto here, is hook up my bench top power supply. And supply three volts to it. And the other thing I'm going to do is check with a frequency counter. So let me turn on my bench top power supply. Now, when I probe things, if I move the camera, just um, for all purposes, just realize that what I am uh, probing is going to be this leg here. 
Um, see if I can get this to focus. Focus, focus, focus. This this leg right here coming off of this uh, oscillator, this crystal. All right. So voltage down on benchtop power supply. I'm gonna slowly increase that voltage up to three volts. After messing with my daughter's necklace, I realized that uh, there's probably an inrush of voltage from his power supply in my previous video. And it sparked a bit when I just turned it on after turning it off at the uh, voltage required for that toy to operate. So now I make sure my voltage is turned way down before I turn it on, and then I slowly increase it back up. All right, so I am going to probe here. And if I flip my camera, uh, you'll see that I'm getting 480,000 hertz. Uh, it's actually showing uh, megums is illuminated out to the right. But uh, if you look at that decimal, I'm before the decimal points, so that's 480,000 hertz. Now I'm pretty sure we can see this as well on an oscope. For those of you who like to see things on an oscope. Okay, so I'm going to disconnect my... Uh, one mega ohm uh, probe from the frequency counter and hook it up to my oscilloscope and get that turned on and let's see if I can refocus this camera a bit so again it's going to be the same connection on there and I'll focus this up here turn off that light Okay, there we go. All right. So, let's see. Again, same leg. Showing something. See, I got my vertical control volt set to 500 millivolts. So, uh, let's do one volt since we know it's a three volt battery. Uh, horizontal control is currently set to uh, 50 nanoseconds. Let's make that smaller. 250 nanoseconds. It's a horizontal or span per division. Might be on some oscilloscopes. Let's make it that bit smaller. We'll do 500 nanoseconds. And actually, I want to make that picture a little bit bigger. 500 nanoseconds and our vertical is set to 500 millivolts. Trigger seems to be pretty good, so my waveform's not moving around a whole lot. That's good. Um, let's check our peaks with our cor cursor controls. See what frequency we're getting. So cursor mode, turn it to horizontal. All right, cursor A, we will set to this peak, and then cursor B, we will move over to this peak, all right, can I get that focus a bit, oh no, all right, there we go. You can see with my cursors, uh, 2.06 microseconds. Take the inverse of that, you get around 480.7 kilohertz. So, you know, frequency and time are the inverse of each other. I uh, wonder what an automatic calculation will turn up. Me remove the probe for a second. Play with my measurements menu. Actually, go back cursors. I'm going to turn that off. Measurements menu. All measurements. Uh, turn voltage on. 
turn time on. Man, that's a lot of different measurements. Probably, you know, turn the voltage back on. But let's see. This gives me, and there you go. Uh, fairly accurate. Auto measure. 2.08 microseconds, 480-ish kilohertz. It's giving you both of your rise and fall times in nanoseconds, which you, we can measure with the cursor controls as well. That was me removing the probe. That's why you saw it jutter like that. And, uh, and cool. Add. Hopefully, hopefully that's beneficial for anybody who's never measured a uh, crystal before us. This is a couple ways of doing it, either with your oscilloscope or if you got a little cheapo frequency counter. Um, this one I have is made by Ellen Co. I think uh, it's an F1300. Got it off of eBay for relatively cheap. I uh, primarily only use this input, uh, but make sure you take notice of your input requirements. This, I couldn't use C with this type of probe, with like an oscope probe. Oh, that's me unplugging it. Because these are uh, one megohm uh, probes. So that's why I use input A. I can have a max of 300 volts. You can make a DC to 100. 20 megahertz. I can measure between DC to 120 megahertz. I would need a 50 ohm cable to use this one up here. That could get me from 50 megahertz to 1.3 gigahertz. Max voltage would be 3 volts. Though. So you got to make sure that the voltage that you're supplying uh, that's right in that frequency is no greater than 3 of blow the input. Uh, then we have an input B here with this ratings. There's also a nice forum online where you can modify these things and make them more responsive and more accurate without hours of warm-up time. I've had this thing on for practically three hours, three or four hours while I was making the circuit diagram. But uh, yeah, anyways, digressing a bit here. Uh, this essentially is as far as this. So the next thing that uh, I'm going to do is try to figure out a way to get rid of this bleed inside of the LCD itself. So hold on a second for that. All right. Now if anything for me to attempt to do, let me be honest, this has me the most nervous. Okay. So turn off the light for a second. You can see the bleed here and here and down here in this corner on this LCD. Now this isn't really, what I'm about to show you isn't really a fix. It's still a bad LCD. It's just trying to get this bleed out of the way of the screen. Now some of it might settle back into the wherever it should be at. Um, <clears throat> but there's a method for getting rid of the bleed is by applying pressure, equal pressure, bottom, bottom, with your finger, and top, like a pinching pressure. And massage in the screen to get the bleed over into like one corner. Okay? Now I could potentially crack the uh, crack this glass and ruin this uh, LCD further, which I don't want to do. Um, so I'm going to record this now again equals pressure and what you do is you, you put pressure in between these areas and essentially try to massage it outwards you'll see it warm up maybe with my fingers it'll start to move change shape a little bit No, it's hard to see in this lighting. I don't have the best.
There's a thick piece of glass, so it's actually many parts to the, to the LCD. Basically what you have is a polarizer of sorts, uh, glass substrate, lower and upper glass sub substrate, um, with transparent electrodes, and then your liquid crystal sandwiched in between. Uh, and the voltage is passed through there, like from the cob, um, to excite the liquid crystals to produce a picture for you. But I'm, it's going to take me a while, I think, to do this method, so I'm going to try to film what I can, as best as I can, and um, we'll see how this turns out. Alright, I think that's as good as I'm going to get it at this point. And now I started, I'm going to have to polish up this glass because obviously I've put some very fine scratches in it. Pretty fine scratches? Yeah, buddy. Uh, with this tool right here, uh, plastic tool, but that's fine, I can polish that off, it won't be noticeable. Now you saw me switch gears a little bit from just finger pressing to... Um, actually using my hot air station. I uh, turned the hot air station uh, airflow to 40, temperature to 212 just to get it uh, you know warmed up because I figured just thinking through my head and I don't know if I'm if I broke this thing made it worse probably did who knows but you know that's the point of trying out something. Uh, I figured you know liquid is in the name right liquid crystal display. I figured if I heated up the liquid crystals a little bit they might become a little more uh, uh, viscous or malleable or whatever the term you want to use and that could help me keep pressure underneath and move them along and move, and move them along and move them across the entire glass. Now remember it started out over here and we got it all the way over to this end so the technique I did is I uh, Using my hot air gun, I'd heat it up for a couple seconds, starting from the edge out towards the object. And then um, I would apply a pressure and just kind of push back and forth after removing the heat I'd, uh, until the back end there. And I started to get really impatient because it was well over an hour of doing this and my fingers were actually throbbing from how much pressure I was putting on the glass. I'm surprised I didn't crack this screen. Um, you know, I would remove the heat and apply pressure, and 
centimeter or millimeter by millimeter to start moving again. Uh, and I just re rinse and repeat that process. So now I'm gonna polish this up and get it clean. Uh, we'll get it back into the board, but uh, onto the PCB. But there were a couple things I also noticed that I wanna take care of on this PCB before uh, buttoning it up. Uh, I obviously, I'm gonna have to remove these wires I soldered in, uh, put the speak solder the speaker back in place. But I also noticed on this uh, 47 microfarad decoupling uh, capacitor sitting here that uh, you know you've got solder joints that are not good. I mean, if you flip to the other side, I mean it's practically the solder didn't flow all the way through hole. Uh, so I kind of want to touch up some solder points on here. Uh, same thing with this with this um, uh, one in four one four eight uh, uh, diode switching diode sitting here. Um, kind of really want to touch up these points, uh, solder the speaker back in, clean up this board, and then um, then we'll start getting things back together. Back together, final touch. Let's put this uh, keychain back on. Keychain. That's right, bud. Keychain. Baby, can I throw this away right here? Yeah, you can throw that away. back let's get it closed up a little bit all right and I hit this reset button See what happens. Hmm. Almost like we have some segments missing and some ghosting. I don't know if that will last or if it's just because of heating that screen up that we got that. 
Um, looks like you're setting the day and time. Let's see. Yep, two, three, four, five, six. That's an A beside there. So just switch to a P. All right, so that's uh, an N. What's that do? Oh, that sets the day. Friday sets your. Sorry, that's your man hand. That's your hour end. And trying to make sure that there's not a glare from the camera that enters. So, well, I'm not going to count this as a complete failure. Uh, obviously, we didn't damage the screen so bad that we're not getting the display. We successfully moved uh, that out of the corner over to there. Uh, sound works. What was the, what was the issues with this again? Let's see the chicken thing. LCD bad. Power was good. Sound was good. Buttons were good. Needed clean. So we cleaned it. The buttons are still functioning as they should. The sound, if you could hear the beeping, is still there. Uh, the LCD was a little bit dim. Uh, when I first turned it on, if, if I'm going from memory. And then we have that bleed over here. We were able to move the bleed out of the way. The LCD is no longer dim, uh, but it does look like we are missing segments out of here. And I don't know if that's because of the the work we did on the LCD itself, or maybe potentially because of the uh, zebra strips in there not making a good connection. Uh, however, you know, this was a cheapo knockoff made from China. I think we successfully demonstrated that you can move bleed out of the way uh, to kind of re recuperate some screen space. So overall, I think this was a, a good attempt, um, possible attempt at repairing a, a damaged LCD. Which means that eventually, when we get to the one that had the bigger bleed on it, we could potentially repair it. Um, yeah, looks like uh, this guy, what is he, trying to hatch or something? And then maybe over time, uh, because I did clean those zebra, zebra strips, uh, maybe that will clear up. Uh, only time will tell. I am glad, glad that it's not so dim on the display anymore. see what happens. I'm going to let it run for a minute and pause the video. Mm, it just started making noise. What? Making noise? Yeah, it did. Mm. 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 <coughs> Age. Some other things hard. There goes our little Tamagotchi. And that cycles through the top portion <coughs> just fine. And there on the bottom. Temperature. Okay. So really the bottom, I don't know if you can see that. It's moving. And the top. Is cycling through just fine. All right, I must be the select over here and feed them. Well, if I knew what else to do with this, other than replacing the screen and maybe those zebra strips, uh, zebra strips, we could have a completely functional um, uh, little knockoff uh, Tamagotchi. Now, I might do a bit of research online, but I suppose they're going to be very hard to come by. 
Uh, that being said, I'm pretty happy with at least uh, the repair attempt on this. And for some closure, uh, batteries came in, and as you can see, the button actuates. Uh, simple circuit shouldn't, shouldn't have any issues, and the LED lights up. Uh, you know, I think this was the first item we covered. It spins around now, uh, just fine. Changing characters every time. A little difficult to do one-handed. And obviously we learned a little bit on this one as far as uh, when you have LCD bleed. Yes, it can be moved. Um, you know, there's some techniques behind that. Overall, was this one a success? No, it's not a perfect repair. Now, I'll be honest with you, and, and the screen is still messed up. Um, I'm probably going to play around with this off camera, not for this video. Uh, fiddle with the zebra connector. Maybe that's, maybe that's the issue why we're getting... Now the heat could be what's causing the ghosting, but I think the zebra connector is the reason why we're missing segments off of the screen. So I will do a bit of playing, um, maybe come back and do a little revisit on this one at some point. But for the purpose of, um, you know, nine individual virtual pets, because I think calling them all Tamagotchis is not correct, especially the only ones with that label are these McDo two McDonald's toys. Uh, I don't know. What would you have done different? What would you suggest uh, to do differently? Uh, and then concerning this, I couldn't find a LCD replacement. I did a lot of digging online and couldn't find anything. So I'll throw this out to the uh, community that's currently following me. If you happen to know um, a proper replacement for this screen, can link it, uh, provide comments in the description. I, I would like to know. I mean, I think I found like uh, some modern uh, LCD screens, but they don't have the same uh, segment, same seg segment counts, um, nor the same um, <clears throat> termination points to the zebra connector. The uh, the runs. Hi, Audrey. My daughter's over here. I, I think there is at least 68, uh, 34 at top and 34 at the bottom. Um, uh, traces on that screen where there had to be individual connections but anyways uh, this is going to tie up this video if you enjoyed it get a thumbs up uh, if you're new to the channel please consider liking uh, or subscribing and uh, turning on notifications and uh, potentially sharing with your friends um, as always have a good one bye So I had to do a revisit and actually uh, this is well past beyond the point that I finished filming for part two. But this will be a Hail Mary of sorts trying to get this one repaired. And I believe I mentioned I think uh, potentially re replacing the zebra connectors would help. So I found some off of eBay. They're not necessarily the exact same uh, color as the ones in here. These came in from China. They were made to order per se. So the old zebra connectors, I, I measured them out. The not so much concerned about the length but the width and the height is definitely important. Uh, the length you can just cut. I believe that's that's perfectly acceptable. So, what I'm going to do is pull out the zebra connectors that are in here and cut those and replace them. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I'll probably fold this video back into part one so when you watch it uh, it will look like hey I just reattacked it again um, just know that a recording of that series of videos it was a long time it was a long probably about a month ago um, I've since moved on to part two eventually I'll get to part three uh, it just takes a lot of time to come back and, and spend the time to do this but anyways that's enough waffling I will take this apart 
not record it, just take it apart. But I'm gonna, after I have it taken apart, I'll cut it, put it together, and we'll see what happens. back apart and uh, see if I could melt the plastic posts in here get the screws to set a little better and when I bend the PCB uh, top and bottom start to get what I want to see but as soon as that pressure is let off it dis disappears. So potentially not just that worn out, but you know this PCB, it, it, it could have just had it. it could be too warped. But what I'm going to try to do is I cut these little square pieces of the old uh, uh, zebra connector, and I'm going to use them as uh, I'm going to put them through the screws on here and see if I can't. At least when I put these down into here, see if it will add additional pressure. Not sure it will, but uh, here's the hoping. Which means I gotta unsolder this, and this is gonna be an all in one kind of thing. I have to undo my power supply from testing again. And see if we can't get something good on this board. that's what I'll be doing next uh, again I'm not gonna record it you know this video is probably super super long just understand that this those screws are gonna go through these pads to help put pressure on on the board and this these specific points all right moment of truth let's reset it batteries are in and womp womp womp. We still got a bad display, and it's probably because of me heating it up. You know, when you heat up uh, the crystals inside an LCD, they they are actually stimulated, and that's why we got the uh, the black going across and then it regressed back. Just as if you put an LCD in, say, a freezer for like five or ten minutes, it's going to take them a lot longer to try to stimulate and get. It's working again. Um, I don't know. I gave it the best I'm willing to give it uh, without a direct screen replacement. Um, those self tapping screws that are used for this thing are pretty terrible as well. You can only get them to go in a finite amount, even though I've got pretty good pressure. But when you start spinning more because they're self tapping, they just eat away at the inside of the plastic and, and loosen back up. Uh, maybe with some different screws, maybe with a new screen. Um, maybe if I had a little one of those uh, 3D pins to actually just spew out a bunch of hard plastic to create new posts, we could potentially get this uh, working again. You know, thinking, thinking future, I might just hold on to this and try something like that. And, but I've spent as much time as I'm willing to spend on this. Unfortunately, we're going to call it a failure, but I still feel like I learned a lot. Also thought about swapping out with this uh, screen over here, but side by side comparison, you can tell that the screen is a little bit smaller than this guy, and I'm pretty sure it's not the same segments uh, throughout the screen itself. So, well, if you like the video and. Uh, 
Yeah, at least we're entertained, regardless of the uh, failure with this one item. Then uh, give it a thumbs up and uh, subscribe and share and appreciate your time. Uh, you have a wonderful day, and if I could leave you on anything to think about, uh, if you get cream, that Betty Crocker cream cheese icing, is there any real cream cheese in it? Food for thought. Take care. Bye.